Good morning. Uh, I am Leandro. My friend here is Juarez. We work for a uh, uh, company called Global.com. We were in the team that was responsible to deliver the live broadcast over the internet to the last World Cup, last World Cup. But it's not the rugby one, it's the soccer one. So it will be a different uh, talk. Anyway, although we see, you will see only two of us in here, uh, there is an amazing team behind us, with us. So we just uh, a small representation of the, the work we will present he here today. And there's another team, an interaction, so it's not only with two, two of us. I would like to make three big disclaimers, not big uh, disclaimers, about number one, since we are we come from Brazil, we have like uh, not very uh, very many opportunities to speak in English, so we might be we might do some uh, mistakes, and I hope you can help us. And if you don't understand, please raise your hand and ask, and, and we can try to explain that using another words. And another thing that I would like to say is that you see this picture of persons. Although we lo we lose the World Cup and we made that that awful thing, losing for German, we were very happy with the, the, the project itself, I mean, to deliver the, the, the World Cup. And another thing we need to say right up front is that we were restricted to Brazil only, so we, we were not uh, responsible to broadcast live streaming for the, the entire world. And we thought, in a way, to present this like a history, telling the past and going to the, the, way, the time that we come into the, the team. And then we start to build in upon the, the past uh, platform, video platform, to build the next one. So I think it will be a way better for you to understand the pains we've been through. And a best way to, start, to talk about that is start to telling about the past, how we were on the last World Cup. It was uh, Africa 2010. So, thank you, Leandro. And as you said, we are going to talk uh, briefly about our experience in 2010 and why it didn't work and why we decided to adopt NGINX. So, in 2010, we were using Flash Media Server. And for streaming live video, it basically works like that. First, you need a camera. And the camera will send the signal, the video, raw video signal, to a, an encoder. And then from the encoder, it will transform it to our TMP and use a video and audio codec. We use H264. And you, we, we use the RTMP protocol to push this through a FMS server. And to deliver the signal to the audience, we then send it uh, to another server or a pharma servers that you also use the RTMP protocol to deliver the video directly to the users, to the flash video player. And this uses the, a protocol specific, a port specific for this protocol, the 1935. And sometimes you have issues with firewalls. But the main thing is that we were using RTMP for everything. And it's a stateful protocol. So it makes it a little bit hard to do redundance and failover. And as you see in the following slides, it has some drawbacks. But the good part of our TMP is that the delay is, little, is very small, it's just a couple of seconds, from two to five seconds. And another issue that we had with Flash Media Server is that uh, it's a proprietary software, and we couldn't debug it, we couldn't add instrumentation. So all we had was to tail the logs and to use the shell to, to monitor what was going on. So as I said before, it's a stateful protocol, so another issue is scalability. If you have uh, several users in one server and it fails, all the users will need to connect again to a different server. And 
probably, if it's already in a high load situation, the second server will fail, and all your servers will fail in cascades. And we saw that happen, and we could see the money flying away through the window, and all our audience as well. So in the next slide, we can see a chart of a match that we were broadcasting. And in the half time, we had a peak, and a server failed, and we lost to more than half of our audience. And sometimes you don't have time to recover. Live events are really hard. You have, just have one chance to do it right. But even though we could achieve uh, some respectable numbers, at least for Brazil, we got three, almost 300,000 uh, uh, simultaneous users. And the maximum bit rate, that's not that high, but it's uh, OK quality. Yeah, one important thing to say here that although we show you that history, that past history, we just jump in on the team on the, probably this, this slide for uh, forward. So we need, uh, the, the internet was growing, the, the, the people, the internet connection was uh, getting more support, so we have mobile phones and everything. And then we have the, the need of delivering the live video to also to mobile, mobile, mobile devices. It all starts with a show called Big Brother. I know you, I think we know which, which show it is. So what we noticed was this, that all this is, not, not all the, the smart device can play RTMP, which is a flash thing. So for instance, iPhone and iPad, the iOS things, they really require you to use like HLS protocol to broadcast live content. So we, we entered on this team at that time. So we were like, how, how history on the team is, is start, uh, start right now, in that, that point, in 2012. Yeah. Uh, just before we go on, I, I want to explain very briefly how the HLS works. So HLS was well, a protocol proposed by Apple. I will say that it works uh, in a basic way like this, like this. Supposedly, we are the player. The first thing we need to do is like, the, to request a, a playlist, which is a text file full of uh, uh, links of uh, links of links. So you have a playlist which have another. Uh, each line of the playlist is a, another playlist. This first one is like the playlist of qualities. Let's say this way. Yeah, it just lists all the bit rates available. Yeah, the bit rates, and then your phone, your your desktop will figure out which which quality it can uh, play. For instance, let's say you are a on, on a mobile phone in a 4G, then you, your phone, your, your, the protocol decides that you can run uh, save, save 720p, and it gets this another uh, playlist, which has a list of segments with uh, like uh, chunks of video, and then it starts to get the videos. And it uh, will fill the buffer, and will start, start to play the, the, the video itself. And it will get to update the playlist, and, and we'll make the cycle again and again and again. So basically, it's, we move from the RTMP to HTTP, which we move. The, the better thing we, we get, if, get rid of was the stateful protocol, or stateful stateful, let's say, protocol, the RTMP, to, state, to stateless protocol, HTTP. We're going to show that in the uh, better slide. So our first solution, with our, uh, which the, the introduction of uh, HLS was, we still have the same way to capture the video. We still will push the, the streaming using RTMP, RTMP. I have a problem by saying this name. But anyway, and then we change, uh, we, we still are using a proprietary server, but it was uh, easier to integrate, integrate, like with every string, which you can push uh, RTMP, and you will get out of it like uh, HLS stream. That was the uh, chunks and playlists I showed you before. And it will, it will save on a folder, a common folder, and then we, use, we introduce I Nginx to distribute the load. So now we can. Um, 
we can respond to the iPhone, to Android, and even to the Flash player. We need to, at the time, we don't have a HLS Flash player. We need to do that in-house. It was a great, great, great time. So the first solution was the most basic one, was like just taking the root path and make it available. So let's, let's dig in, in, the, in this part that I call generation distribution. So we have the front end and the back end, and then we have this Nginx. Uh, making a very simple way is just this way. We, conf we set up the every string to generate the HLS uh, videos on the server or on the folder, and then we say that that location, a given location will be a uh, root for that location will be the same folder we use on the every string. So the first solution was just this one. And it works well. It, it works well. We have pretty much the basic things. We have a load balance in front of each layer, uh, doing the cache, authentication, and generation. And it was pretty, pretty well. Nothing very fancy, just the usual. And then I'm going to say that we, I just forgot to mention that we did that, that experiment with HLS was only for like, 2% of the users, two or f I don't know, I don't remember. We just made an uh, uh, um, experiment using uh, HLS. We still have the RTMP, but then we figured out that the results, the results was, was, well, were nice. So we could change RTMP for 100% of our users. So we think, let's change our multi protocol to just one. At that time, it was a good idea. OK. So, but we didn't base it, uh, this change only our, on our guesses. We have like, uh, some metrics to see if it's a, a better or, or worse experience for users. So we noticed that a buffering was a, a little bit a much, much better while using our HLS compared to RTMP. And we have tons of uh, different metrics to see the user experience was better while using HLS. Yeah, the startup time was lower, and the playing time was, on average, much higher. So we were sure that HLS was working much better than RTMP. Yeah, with that information, we just moved it to the HLS 100%. And then, since we changed it for, to HTTP, we introduced something very good that is instrumentation. Since we ha now have like the HTTP, we could uh, set up a log stash to get the, the, log, the data log and send it to Redis. And then we have another log stash, the pretty much uh, standard thing, and send it to the graphite. And then we have some agents too which will make SNP to understand how the CPU were working and send the metrics also to Graphite. And that makes us to have a, a dashboard, a pretty, a pretty nice dashboard which was very useful because we have the, the, how can I say, the picture of the whole farm. We can see if we are, we are having more cache misses than uh, that, the pretty much st standard thing. But we, did, we didn't have that at the time. It was a nice thing to have this, uh, this. Since we changed for HTTP, we could get this one. And just to summarize, this Sauron thing is just the graphite and Rails and Angular. It's not something very cool or very hard to do. And I think, well, we we changed it from RTMP to HLS, but it was not only uh, good stuff. We've been through some silly stuff that, like that. This next one, I think most of you will probably figure out what we you need to do, but we missed that. So I think it's important to put this uh, slide on and talk about it. So when you are caching uh, while using, oh, yeah, we use uh, Nginx for caching. So when you're caching, you use, usually want to cache proc, you lock your cache to not uh, pass all the requests to the back end. And that's pretty much a common thing. Um, but we forget about one silly thing. Let's say, for instance, you, a request come to your server. And then it, it requests the expired chunk, expired, expired video. Then the re this request will pass to the backend. But what happens if like, uh, more and more requests come at the same time while the Nginx is on the state updating? I might be using the 
not the standard uh, name for Nginx, but I'm just saying the e example. For example, Nginx is updating, and then if you don't configure it properly, it will all pass to the back end. So it was a problem. It's a very silly problem, but we pass into, we've been through that. So your back end will be in a high load situation. And then I see it's silly, but we be, we've been through that. And don't forget to use prox cache use in several states by, while liquidating too. Another thing that I need to rush because the time is running out. So we, need, we also did some load testing to see how much we can get from one machine. And we noticed that without doing nothing, and just throwing the Nginx and the stuff on the pretty much uh, the servers we have, we only were capable of uh, getting uh, throughput, the network throughput, about 5 gigabytes. And we have uh, network cards, about 10. It was not so good. Then we start to look at the internet to understand where, where was the problem. And then we figure out it was not uh, Nginx, was because there is like hierarchy balance that we need to, uh, as a service that can Instead of, in a quick way, let's say each time a request comes to your network, it will trigger a, an R key, and there, is, there needs to be someone to handle that. If you don't configure anything in, in our servers, for example, I don't know if it's a default thing for all servers, you will have a problem because the, all the requests will come to the same CPU. So the first thing was we used the R key balance. So we were, we were able to reach 10 gigabytes. Anyway, but then we figured out that we could uh, get more gigabytes, but then we noticed that we, using our key balance, we were losing package a lot. And then we noticed, uh, and then uh, researching more and more, we discovered that it's better to make a NIP, uh, what is the name, a CPU affinity? Uh, yeah, we create several interrupts for each network card, and each interrupt is pinned to a CPU. So instead of a single CPU, handling all the interrupts, you can uh, spread the load across several CPUs. So with that, we could increase the throughput to almost the limit of the network card interface. Yeah, we, since we have two network cards, we could bond them and have 20 gigas per machine. And, and I believe that the main takeaway is that uh, we didn't have to tune Nginx by itself, but the operational system. Nginx worked just fine, like a charm. Yeah, it was not a fault of Nginx. It was our fault, as almost always. And just to summarize, what we got was uh, we get rid of the problem of the port, because we are using 80 for HTTP. We have caching, amazing caching uh, from Nginx. We also have scalability easy, because it's just a matter of uh, uh, spun another machine or a virtual server. And then you have another. Uh, Another way to scale, scale very easy. And also, we got a user experience in that sense is that since we, we know that HLS proved to be better on, on uh, adaptation algorithm, like it noticed better which algorithm, it, or which bit rates the user needs to have. So we increase, uh, we make the user experience better. And we also love the, the instrumentation thing that we can see what was going on on the farm. And just to, to summarize, uh, the farm we have is like uh, we have only 80 nodes. And we have CentOS. And you can see uh, the, uh, all the data on the, on the slide itself. So, but then the World Cup requires us to do another feature, which is a DVR. And that makes us a little more pain in knowledge. Yeah, by 2013, we were really happy with our infrastructure and the experience that we were delivering. And we started to think what else we could do for the World Cup. And one of the features that we decided to develop is DVR. That stands for Digital Video Recording. And it just adds the ability to the user to pause the video, to seek back, and maybe watch the goal again. So to do that, for HLS, DVR is just a larger playlist. You have seen that the playlist is just a text file that lists the segments. So instead of just a, a couple of seconds of video, it will list the segments for the whole match. 
And uh, as you seen before, this was our solution. And we can say that there is two main parts, the ingest part and the front end. And the interface between both of them was this storage, just files that we were segmenting and make, making them available for Nginx to deliver. So storage was a problem because we didn't have failover. If the stream stopped and we had to start again, uh, the server that we were using, EvoStream, would just erase the playlist and start a new one. This is not a problem if you don't have the VR, because the user will just see a small bump and reconnect again, and the stream will continue normally. But if you lose the, the older playlists, then the user will not be able to seek back in time. So we need to keep all the segments and the playlists. So to do that, Oh, sorry. Before that, uh, we also were a little bit worried about the storage, because for a single stream, a single match, we would split that in several bit rates, six in this case. And each bit rate is a different quality, depending on the user benefit to be able to watch one or another. But in total, it uses about 4.5 megabytes for each for five seconds. So for a two-hour game, that would be around six gigabytes. And we were having two simultaneous games and other streams that the company broadcasts. And we need about 40 gigabytes. That's not too much. We can put it all in RAM. So we decided to go ahead and use uh, Redis as a storage for video. We're just replacing that uh, older folder structure where we were saving the data, we're saving the chunks and HLS files to the Redis. Yeah, it works like that. We built a daemon in Python, a simple script that we would watch the files and move the files as they were segmented to a Redis database. And then we used the Nginx with the Lua module to just fetch the list of streams from the Redis and build the playlist dynamically. It just could, took a day or two to, to make that work. It was thing, really used to, to developing Lua. One thing I, I think uh, it was really nice, but was really hard to do, was also to scale Python. I don't know if because we don't have experience, but it was not easy to make Python scale to uh, uh, several cores. And this file that you see, that demo the mon monitors the file change and save it HLS, gives us a lot of pain. Maybe today we would choose another language. But was the simple solution to have that time, and it's still working today. Yeah, this became a problem, especially when we had the general election in Brazil, and you have a different string for each state. So we were having more than 30 simultaneous streams. And then, as Leandro said, the Python script became a bottleneck. And also Redis, we couldn't put all this in memory. So we moved, decided to move that from Redis to Cassandra. And all these stories that we're talking about to you were happening while we were preparing to the World Cup itself. And some of them maybe happened a little bit before, but we, we stretched that in the little history to become more easy to understand. Yeah, for the World Cup, we were still using Redis. This happened after, but we thought that was interesting to share here. So we didn't have to do much changing in, in this demo, besides the scalability issues. But in the front end, we had to develop a new driver for Lua. We didn't find anyone at the time for, for Nginx. So we write one ourselves. And it was really great to see the adoption of it. The guys at the Kong booth, I don't know if you have checked that out, are using the model. And we are really proud of that. Most, so, of, the, most of the cool things we did on that time was not something that we planned to. That first, for instance, this driver was started by this guy. And 
we didn't know we, we could do that, but it was a nice thing to do, and was, we, were ha we are very happy of this, like this little achievement. Like just a drive for, a first drive for Lua Cassandra Nginx, or Lua Cassandra, sorry. And can you go ahead? OK, so another thing that we had to build was the waiting room. We don't use a CDN, and we have links with several internet providers in Brazil. So, and we have two data centers. So sometimes a user would be watching a, a video from an ISP that had a low bandwidth with us, and that might uh, make the experience worse for everybody in that ISP. So we decided to build a waiting room. If too much users were watching from the same link, we would put them on our queue. We'll get more details in the further slide. But before that, let me talk br briefly. We start this saying that we were restricted to Brazil only, and to the mode homing solution, that, that way, to make a single IP, like a, a, a illusion of a single point, we choose to go by any case. Uh, explain in a simple, very way, any case works this way. You have the BGP protocol, which announces the route, and then we have the ISPs, because since we are an internet company, we are autonomous system. I don't know if I say that correctly. And we can exchange uh, data, hot data, with the company's ISP. So we announce a route, and then uh, our ISP will acknowledge that data, that route. And then let's say if you have a group of users uh, near to Sao Paulo, then when, when it, like, uh, try to reach a given address, your ISP will wisely route the, the, your request to the pop near to you in a very basic sense. But then now we get more about this uh, uh, waiting room that what is we're talking about, which is a system. We just give it this name because it's really a waiting room. We make a, 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 a queue where the users with a bad experience will be on the queue, and then you have like let me just give the example. For, for instance, this ISPY, uh, you have, we don't have a way to control how much bandwidth we, they have connected with us. And then their users might face in some problems, some troubles to watch us. But they will, they will not uh, claim about their ISP. They will tweet in about us. And we need to make a way that we, it, that problem will be less, less annoying to us. And that is the waiting room that he is talking about. So that was the back in the napkin draft that we did. But basically, the player just asks us if there is room for him. And we would check in which route, it, in which link we were, he would be streaming. And if the link had enough capacity, it, we would pass him through. Or if not, we would put them in a queue. And you had to use a fork of Redis that has this new data structure called the interval sets that we use it to put the, all the available routes in it. So it made the lookup of uh, an IP address to a link really fast. And we also had to build uh, scripts that would listen to the BGP protocol and save the, that data in Redis. But it was easy to, to build a, a microservice with Lua again that would check this database. And, and again, we use Nginx on the front end to deliver the, the, this server, the, this service. So now I'm going to talk about the results. So the data that will really matter to you. I don't know if you were guys like soccer as, uh, as we do. But we were not happy with that, with that result, but it's part of the, time, part of the life. <laughs> anyway, one of the th cool things, I think, of this experience was the, for me at least, for, was the way we were able to use the bandwidth. So this graph shows roughly uh, the, the peak points where, where we have games that were uh, online and with people working. So we have this one were not all the games, but we're going to show you the data. But I am very excited. Well, I was very excited with the, how many bandwidth we, can, we could use. 
we were expecting like 1 million users, but we could reach more than 500, but it was not that much. So we were kind of not very happy. But maybe it's because the, when Brazil was playing, when Brazil was playing the game, people were able to watch the game from their house. So they prefer to watch on television. And another cool number that I like is that six, six, 640 gigabytes in a one game. So it's, I think it's a pretty, a pretty good number, at least for me. Uh, and another thing that we did, since we have that instrumentation, instrumentation we could roughly make a, a, guess a guess estimation using graphite that summing all the, the watch, it, watch, it, watch it time, it was roughly 1,600 years. And then we have the 40, 40 million video views. And then you can read that. And one thing that I liked, too, was that we were, we were able to deliver 20 gigabytes using only 10 percent of the CPU. OK. So now that you show you the results, I think it's time to say, uh, make a recap and tell me about your, the next step we think it's possible for our platform. So we use uh, the NGINX a lot for video streaming itself. We use it for delivery, for caching. We develop modules for geolocation, authorization, authentication, and we build a lot of our services around it. So we use an Nginx and Lua for the playlist generation, for the waiting room. Uh, another system that we had that we didn't mention was the uh, system that locks the amount of concurrent sessions that a single user can have. But this is most for closed broadcasts, not for something like the World Cup. And we really love Nginx and Lua. We are anxious to try the Nginx script that was just announced. But we, we are really happy with Lua. It was made in Brazil, but that's not relevant. That, that's not all. relevant. <laughs> I, we should look at the technical side. Uh, one model that we tried and we love it is Busted. And it works great for test-driven development. It made uh, our lives easier. And Lua itself, we think that's pretty easy to, to, to get. It's a small language. And comparing to the C model developing Nginx, we had a much better experience. It was much faster to develop in Lua. And the performance is really close. You can get a performance near C. So we, we are really happy with that. It was easier, at least for us, because we are not like uh, Expert guys. Expert C we, developers. We, we, and we, we even did a, a module, help a module of Nginx, but we were more proficient on Lua. OK. One of the cool things we did from that time was we, we push ourselves to make the, almost all the software we did to open source. So we did this player that called Clapper, which, which is on, on production now. And we are using it. And it's receiving a lot of support of, from community. And it's pretty well, pretty good. We also have this, anyway, we have the M3, 8, M3 U8 yeah, parser, which is the Python to read the playlist from, uh, from or HLS. Yeah, HLS. Yeah, but summarizing to open to question, we come from 2010 to 2014, showing that we changed from RTMP to HLS, and then we introduced this feature called DVR, and now we're looking forward to the Olympic Games. So maybe we we will offer a different kind of uh, formats like Dash. We will change the ingest, the way that the sign is ingested, and maybe four key. But I don't know. We just move out from the team, so we just make the presentation. One thing that we know for sure is that we will keep using Nginx. Yeah. And so, sorry. Ahead. That's all we have. We, I hope you have learned something of, out of it. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you. OK. Thank you.
<laughs> so he asked how many users were watching the match between Brazil and, and Germany. Uh, I think that after the third goal, none. <laughs> but uh, no, just kidding. I the audience for the Brazil match was low because everybody was watching on the, the TV, not on the internet. But it was around 100,000 users. Yes. Open source machines. Uh, the question was, does front end that we were using to cache and using Nginx, we're using uh, default uh, open source commit Nginx or uh, Nginx Plus. No, we, we, we were using community one. Yeah, we, we were using the community, the default Nginx open source solution. One. And we, we do have some hardware load balancers that we, we, we use it to split the load across several instances of Nginx. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Was, was OK. It? Another one? OK. Yeah, we'll notice that just one core. Ah, oh. sorry, I have to repeat the question yeah. first. So the question was, how did we notice that we need our IR key balance or the CPU to, to set the CPU affinity? So the first thing that we noticed is that we were losing packets. And the second thing that we noticed is that we just one core of the machine was in use. And the process that was using the most CPU was the process that was handling the software interrupts for the network cards. So then we first added the IRQ balance to split across some cores. And it could have a better, even better performance when we pinned each interrupt to a specific core. It all comes down to the fact that we saw that we have a node with 20 gigas. And we were not reaching that 20 gigas. And we thought, it's maybe a problem with Nginx, or maybe a problem with something, because uh, it's like just serving static files, so I don't think that, that will be a problem. Then we kind of digging and searching and understood the, the things that we, uh, and we, uh, we were able to, to understand and uh, apply those, those changes that he, he just told about it. Yeah, yeah, another interesting number is that if just two Nginx servers yeah. could handle 100,000 users, that was about what we could get with 50 FMS service, flash media service. Another question? OK. We would like to ask you if you have any feedback for us. It would be uh, very good, because we want to be a better person, at least to speak. <laughs> OK? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you again.